the progressive era, the dawn of liberalism and progressivism. So we had all these industrial events happening and creating some positives and some negatives at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. And out of that came a lot of reforms um, that we pretty much take for granted today. <coughs> Excuse me. So under the umbrella of progressivism, you will find Protestant church leaders who are using the social gospel to improve their communities. You have African Americans who are seeking to improve their situation, particularly in the South, but not just limited to the South, all over the nation. You have union leaders that are seeking to work on behalf of child laborers, women workers, and men workers. And then you have feminists who are demanding as women's roles expand in society that they get the right to vote as well. So the philosophy of the progressives um, did revolve around this idea of the social gospel. So you did have Christian organizations involved. This idea of pragmatism, that if something doesn't work, then you should look for a solution that does and use that to replace an old defective system or ideology. <clears throat> and this idea of scientific management, that we can use logic and reason to become more efficient in not only our workplace but in our society as a whole. So the goals of progressivism was to end this idea of white slavery, which comes out of the notion that workers were to be paid little uh, and work many, many hours. Uh, it also involved an idea that alcohol was the bane of society and was evil and therefore should be prohibited from consumption and production. So the idea of prohibition. Uh, this also had a nativist spin and that these um, immigrants that were coming to work here in America were somehow not adapting and adopting American culture and so that they should and should assimilate into our society a little better. So a little bit of social Darwinism involved in there and some racism as well. Um, you had antitrust legislation. Let's break up some of these unions initially and then let's use this legislation to also break up the monopolies in business. Let's restrict those immigrants from moving into the United States. Again, the nativists rallying cry that um, they're taking jobs away from American citizens and they are um, sort of diluting American culture uh, was a, a big issue. And also bringing in disease, and it, these are all stereotypes, bringing in disease and um, ideologies such as communism and anarchy into our society and making chaos. Uh, getting women the right to vote, ending child labor, and regulating private utilities such as electricity and water supplies and, and those sorts of things to take them out of the hands of big business. And then full government ownership was also some people wanted to see those utilities turned totally over to the government and then to get rid of the political machines in the urban areas. And to use the government as an agency of human welfare. The preamble to the Constitution says that in order to promote the general wel welfare and provide for the common defense, the government will have certain uh, roles and responsibilities. And so people said that that should be what government should be doing, was promoting the general wel welfare. So you had several types of reform that occurred during this progressive era. You had structural and political reform in the name of efficiency. You had economic reform, ending monopolies, or at least trying to restrict monopolies. Um, and you had social reforms, which was to promote democracy among a larger um, group of people in the United States. And you had moral reform, this creating a um, moral high ground and creating purity in the United States. So a lot of people were roused to action in part because of a group of people and journalists called muckrakers. And they were attempting to expose abuses within the business system and corruption in politics through research and also using sensationalism. They sold newspapers. Um, the Hearst and the Pulitzers owned large papers that were widely read. That was the main source of news for most Americans at this time. 
And so these muckrakers would go and do this investigative journalism, which is a, his, is a sort of tradition that still exists in journalism today. Some of the big well-known muckrakers are Ida Tarbell and her um, history of the Standard Oil Company. And she digs into sort of the uh, abuses of power there. And then The Shame of the Cities by Lincoln Stevens, looking at sort of the extreme poverty in the United States and the, the political corruption that was occurring there. You also had Jacob Rees. We've talked about this before and his photojournalism of how the other half lives, exposing poverty to the rest of the nation. We've seen these images before. Some more images of life in the cities among the urban poor. Some tenements, pretty squalid housing, prone to fire, disease, etc. And again, you had, um, you know, these are the living conditions of a lot of the, the urban poor. And here's a typical tenement style. They were long, skinny buildings, lots of rooms, very little ventilation. Um, there was, out of this movement, an architectural achievement that, hey, maybe we should create some air shafts and get some fresh air into these buildings. So that comes later. Um, but initially, they were very tight, closed quarters, very confining, without a lot of um, fresh air or light. You can see the fire escapes, people, children playing on them, laundry hanging on them. Again, the laundry drying. Um, sometimes they would share common courtyards. Be in a basement. You also had The Bitter Cry of Children, by another book by John Spargo, talking about child labor conditions. Ah, I ended the show. Sorry, I have issues with my clicking finger. Children working as rock breakers in coal mines. And you have one of the first attempts at reform. The Keating Owen Act um, was the first federal law to regulate child labor, and it prohibited the shipment of goods produced by underage children. So what's the implication of that? Well, that means a lot of products cannot be shipped. And ultimately the Supreme Court strikes this law down because it interferes with commerce and it goes beyond Congress's powers. Some other political reforms, although it did, I will say, it did raise quite a bit of an awareness and you do start to see reforms at the state level. Um, some political reforms, you have increase in participation in the decision-making process by average citizens. You have um, the secret ballot, the Australian ballot is introduced, believe it or not. Um, people didn't vote in private prior to this time in a lot of places, and so there could be a lot of voter intimidation. Um, you had direct primaries, this process of nominating um, candidates for the political parties rather than the party themselves and the party elite choosing candidates. And then you have the direct election of senators with the 17th Amendment, which says that voters are able to elect U.S. senators directly rather than the state legislatures and party members. Um, so you get some more sort of democracy in this time period as well. Other political reforms you see at the state level, this is not at the national level, the introduction in most states of the initiative, the referendum, and the recall. The initiative allows voters to write a piece of legislation and force the legislature to take it up and consider it. So basically citizens can write the laws and vote on the laws. A referendum allows citizens to vote on laws that um, are coming from the legislature and, and or create their own laws too. And recall allows you to remove corrupt or unsatisfactory politician from office. So these are all things that are now sort of taken for granted and still used in the states, but not at the national level. In social welfare, you had social work becoming a new career option as people took this idea of the social gospel and created settlement houses and social justice leaders who lobbied for improved schools, um, kids staying in school longer, having more compulsory education, juvenile courts so that kids were not tried and convicted in adult courts, liberalized divorce laws. Um, 
women often could not sue for divorce and then they were sort of hands tied um, financially afterwards so you get things like alimony put in place you have safety regulations um, in factories and in, in tenement housing uh, parole system so reform of the prison system and limits to the death penalty